department uh, that, you know, when we have events like this, uh, we should have some sort of uh, land and sovereignty acknowledgement of the, uh, you know, the Native American tribes that uh, have called Iowa their homeland. Um, however, we've never done though uh, this before, and I think it would be a little hypocritical for me to do that now with this particular uh, talk. So uh, in the beginning of this, so but if you want to say something, do feel free to do so. Uh, to do so. Um, so let me just introduce uh, um, Chris and and Danny. Um, uh, this is just uh, the um, you know what we uh, what we have here on their uh, CVs. But uh, uh, Christopher uh, Hoktotobi, I hope I said that sort of correctly. Oh, I mispronounced my own name um, because I was raised in California. It was Hoklatubi. and coming back to Oklahoma uh, on some recent trips, I was reminded that it's Tubby. It's which Tubby. invites Teletubby, but uh, it, it's the recognizable pronunciation with the Chippewa and the Choctaw tribe. In my own. <laughs> so. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so he is assistant professor of religion at Cornell College and here in Iowa, uh, enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation, Oklahoma. His first book, Civilized uh, Piety, The Rhetoric Ideas of Pietas and the Roman Empire, at Baylor, was awarded the Manfred Lautenschlager Award for Theological Promise and brings together his training in early Christianity, Greco-Roman archaeology, ancient philosophy, and critical theory. He's also written on Native American interpretations of the Bible and the concepts of doticism in early Christianity. Um, and so he's working now on a project with uh, uh, Danny Zacharias, who's also here. We are very happy to have both of you with us today. Uh, uh, he's an associate professor of uh, New Testament studies at Arcadia Divinity College. And he and his family lives, uh, resides in, and here I'm really going to have a pronunciation issue, uh, uh, Mi'kma, Mi Mi'maki, Mi'maki, is that the? Mi'kma'ki, yeah. Mi'kma'ki, okay. <laughs> Ancestral and unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people, the lands also now known as Nova, Nova Scotia, Scotia. He's originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 territory, where his Cree and Anishabe uh, maternal an ancestors have resided for thousands of years. His research interest in writing on the errors of Gospel of Matthew, ecotheology, and Turtle Island hermeneutics. Um, so both also search as faculty with, with uh, uh, well, I don't quite know what this stands for, but uh, Naitis. Oh, uh, Nates. 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 Okay. And, and what does it stand old. for? Well, um, Danny, do you want to give the history of Because we don't actually give the alliteration anymore because sure. it's actually kind of out of dates. Yeah, yeah. So it was originally... North American Institute for Indigenous Theological Studies. That's what it's short for. It goes by Nates. However, uh, we've stretched beyond North America now. Uh, so we have um, a program in Australia, the lands now called Australia, and have students from all over the globe, different indigenous students uh, in the Philippines and Bolivia, elsewhere. So we still go by Nates because that's what it was known by, but now it's just Nates, an indigenous learning community. Mm -hmm. And we're the first uh, indigenous governed, um, led and organized uh, theological education institution that was recently uh, awarded with accreditation from ATS. Oh, sounds very interesting. Thank you for that. So um, we are now very much looking forward to your joint presentation on uh, reading the Bible on Turtle Island. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And we're very excited about your presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, Danny, you want to pull up the slide on your end? And I will say, Halito uh, Chiba Chikma. Greetings. Um, I'm again coming to you from Mount Vernon, Iowa, down the street from y'all uh, on land that used to be territory to the Bahoke, the Sioux, the Meskwaki Nation, and the, uh, a number of other tribes who have called this land uh, home or at least trading territory or travel territory. And, and Danny, I believe that you in your CV announced already that you're, you're coming from um, what lands you're coming from, right? Yeah, so I'm from originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is Treaty 1 territory. Uh, if you know what North America looks like, we're right in the dead center. Uh, but now I'm in Nova Scotia and have been since 2003 uh, with my family. And uh, just also wanted to quickly shout out before Chris uh, keeps talking a little bit, just that 
uh, our uh, friend and uncle Casey is on the call as well, Casey Church. And uh, congratulations to him. They just had their uh, launch for Good Medicine Way, uh, which is a church that's um, contextually focused and designed uh, to reach indigenous peoples. Well, thank you. Danny, you want to jump on the uh, slide one here and talk about Turtle Islands? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is an image from an artist named Jeffrey George uh, called Turtle Island. And uh, Turtle Island is a designation for uh, the continent of North America amongst indigenous peoples, which some of you may have heard of. It uh, originates from a uh, legend of Nanabush or Nanabozo um, about the creation of this place, this island, uh, now called Turtle Island. And it's a longer story that you can uh, look up. I don't necessarily have time to share it here, but I do want to talk about why uh, Chris and I have tossed around this language of uh, choosing to call it uh, reading the Bible on Turtle Island, and it goes a lot with why uh, and why we think it's necessary to do this type of project is uh, reading the scriptures where you are and from the um, with the histories of where you're from and with the stories that reside in those people and those lands, and so. I thought it was a good way, and uh, we're, we're testing it out on you guys first here because we haven't called it this before, Turtle Island Hermeneutics or uh, Biblical Interpretation on Turtle Island, but um, that idea that uh, we need to take seriously uh, the traditions of our peoples and the traditions of the lands in which we find ourselves uh, and, and signal that um, right at the outset when we talk about this uh, this work of engaging the scriptures um, with the with the eyes that God gave us and embodying the stories and living in the stories that uh, that our peoples uh, have passed on. So uh, that's why we call this or we're testing it out Turtle Island hermeneutics. So that's uh, why we have this image here. Awesome. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Let's see if it works. All right. So the premise of our talk begins with this recognition that no interpretation exists in a cultural vacuum. Uh, the Bible presented here may look like the Bible that many of us grew up with. It's certainly Danny and I were joking that this kind of reminds us of our high school Bibles, both with the color coding and uh, uh, the attempt to, to, to mark out verses that seem meaningful to us. Um, but the way in which many of us were cultured into thinking about scriptural texts was that these letters and prophetic writings and poems were basically God's love letter to us, that they that there's no time or cultural barrier or gap between when these were written to us, simply that we can do a literal or straightforward or common sense reading and have a sense of what the text absolutely means for all people in all times. Uh, next next. Ooh, even, we added graphics, look at that, our tra slide transition here, wonderful. Um, and so this talk moves forward out of this recognition that culture always informs how we imagine, whether it's reading a narrative and putting characters out on display, uh, performing the narrative in our imaginations, or even just simply thinking about what Jesus looks like. And here on this slide, Right, we can trace. Man, if I had time to walk us through the history of the global Christianity, right? There's never not been a culture that has imagined Jesus to look like that culture. Whether we get the Good Shepherd Jesus without his beard and uh, uh, looking like other forms of uh, young Roman men, to depictions of Jesus in the story and Christianity of the East that made its way along the Silk Road to uh, Ethiopian Christianity, the Byzantine Christianity, um, to you know, the famous uh, uh, Mormon depictions of Jesus where he's white and blue-eyed and blonde hair, uh, to modern archeological or at least graphic attempts to try to imagine what a Middle Eastern uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, man living in Judea, Palestine would look like. So next one. So culture is always informing how we interpret what a text means. 
Uh, as I discuss in my religion and American politics course, I teach here at Cornell, plenty of white Christians. And again, I'm not, I want to preface, I'm not saying white Christians in a derogatory or a denig uh, denigrating way, but to denote distinction and difference, right? Uh, but there are plenty of white Christians in the South who believe that interracial marriage and integration were against God's plan for humanity. Well, even into the 1970s, with Bob Jones University losing its tax exemption for discriminating against unmarried African American students, fearing that such unmarried students might eventually marry white students which is a whole nother story uh, we could go down to that leads to the formation of the modern religious right. Uh, that the news stories and political dramas that ignite our passions also inform what we think scripture is speaking to us in any moment or those who hold scripture as an authoritative text. Uh, again, you know, one could question or wonder about how many churches this week will preach on what is actually happening today in the Supreme Court in the state of Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta case, uh, the decision which will have ramifications for indigenous sovereignty within tribal lands, uh, or what pastors informing their opinion of what's happening in this case uh, to determine whether or not indigenous people, indigenous tribes have sovereignty and can try court cases. Um, are they reading and getting this news through Fox News in Oklahoma, or are they reading Rebecca Nagel and Allison Herrera's Washington Post piece that says that most of the court case or the, the, the arguments that it's given by the Oklahoma state um, are just kind of pulling numbers out of thin air and are not actually substantiated uh, or substantiated based on uh, publicly recognized data uh, for driving up fear that unless Oklahoma retains uh, power to dry cases, all these criminals are gonna be left to their own devices. Uh, next slide. So again, um, over the past few decades, scholars of different underrepresented communities in the United States and Canada have gathered together and have collectively written volumes describing what their distinct culture and heritage brings to scriptural texts, both their stories and their, their, their politics and their experience of life in America or life in uh, all across Turtle Island. And so here are a few representations, right? Um, we have Muhurista theology, uh, Asian American biblical interpretation, uh, Issa Macaulay's recent work, Reading While Black. And again, one thing to point out is all these different groups and titles are identifying their different ethnic tradition, but there's a way in which within the field of New Testament and biblical studies, uh, whiteness is invisible, right? Even though it's the center, the Euro kind of American reading of the text are taken as the natural or the inherent or the obvious reading, while Mujerista or Asian American or African American black readings of these texts are the divergent or the marginal ones or the ones that at least have to identify what they're doing to justify the, the significance of their texts. Um, next one. So in, in many ways, what we're presenting to you is not new to you because in 2019, you had Nyasha Jr. from Temple University. Uh, gosh, I think she moved on to another college now, but a wonderful, wonderful scholar who has written on African-American womanist theology present uh, on representations of biblical Hagar for you all. Uh, in fact, actually, the last time I taught my race, gender, and sexuality class in Christianity, I showed my students uh, the recording of this wonderful presentation that you all hosted. Next. So the question comes to us is what about Native American or North American indigenous interpretations, right? The, uh, where this project arose was a few years ago, um, Lisa Bowens at Princeton University um, or seminary reached out to me and asked if I would contribute uh, a, a writing for the Oxford Handbook of Biblical Studies on Native American interpretations of the Bible. And I was eager to do so because in my own uh, doctoral training, I had sought to discover and look for and gather together such resources for my uh, general examination on post-colonial readings of the Bible, but found out there were, wasn't a whole lot written on it. And when I came back to this question a few years ago, still, I could count on my hand the number of books and articles uh, 
written on Native American interpretations of the Bible. And of that, it's actually mostly Native American theology. So trying to think about broad theological themes within the Christian tradition from indigenous perspective. Um, but really, as, as far as um, I have seen, there has only been one substantial work that has uh, come from a biblical scholar with, uh, with training in biblical studies who is uh, focused on a text in particular, the Gospel of Matthew, and is thought to run through that text from an indigenous perspective. And that would be Stephen Charlson's amazing work, The Four Vision Quests of Jesus. Uh, next slide. So on that note, though, I, I do want to recognize and praise the work of Micheline Pesnatubby. You can see that there is a correlation, Pesnatubby and Hakla Tubby. We are both killers. Uh, tubby is the suffix uh, uh, in Chata that means killer or warrior. And uh, when I first moved to Iowa, I was thrilled that I would be down the street from Micheline. Uh, and when I first, because as far as we could tell, we were the only two uh, uh, Choctaws in the United States who are trained in religious studies programs. She coming from the University of Santa Barbara, I went to UCLA, um, and then uh, uh, from Harvard doing biblical studies. Uh, so she was a great resource during my early years here of Iowa. We got lunch together a few times, and she was one of the first people that I initially told this project to um, over lunch at uh, Panera Bread. And um, her own work was inspiration to my own insofar as she too was curious about the ways in which, in, in a related question, traditional Chakta spirituality and customs and cultures were actually preserved within the Chakta nation through different churches. Um, our tribe, although was initially resistant to uh, um, acculturation and coming into the Christian church, uh, for example, by the Trail of Tears in 1830s, maybe 10% of our tribe had uh, uh, converted to Christianity or identified as Christians. But um, as we'll see in a future slide, um, the Chata nation is why uh, 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 largely identifies as a Christian nation, as a Christian tribe. And so she was curious about the ways in which uh, uh, though being a Christian tribe, it maintained within the institution of the church, certain kind of indigenous habits and ceremonies and practices and beliefs and stories. And she tried to document that within her dissertation. Uh, and that would get uh, also replayed out in different articles that she wrote. Um, for example, one quote I found was really powerful and telling um, in her work, uh, uh, it open, which she opens beyond domesticity, uh, quote, in the daytime, I see us as Christians, so that we're Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, and Pentecostals, whatever. But in the nighttime, then we become tribal Chakta people again. Uh, this is an interview with an Oklahoma Chakta minister from 1994. So again, um, what we see in a, a number of those who identify as indigenous and Christian is that for these practices and for these lives, they oftentimes are compartmentalized. Uh, I am Christian in the day and at night, I am practicing my tribal customs and cultures. And this is something that Nick uh, uh, Pestatubby and I had talked about a number of times. And something that I was curious more about is one, I, I, I wanna, in my own side work, I wanna continue to document this and, and think about these, these projects as she began um, because I'm interested in Chata indigenous practices in themselves, but also to think about the ways in which those um, who are not compartmentalizing these identities, but bringing them together and making and bringing them into conversation with one another. Um, and it's only, we feel recently that indigenous Christians have felt empowered to do so. Uh, uh, next slide. So Danny, I, I'm gonna pass the baton to you on this one. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is an image of uh, the First Nations version, which is a translation of the New Testament. It's in English, uh, as English uh, is a, obviously a, a main language for indigenous folks. Um, and so it's um, it, it's fairly recent, but uh, been very well um, received. And so just to explain what that is, in case you haven't seen that before. But the core question, again, in our project is then what are the characteristics and what are some poignant examples of how indigenous peoples in North America on Turtle Island, um, when they encounter scripture, 
Um, how do they see it differently? What uh, contributions do they bring because of their perspective, because of their cultural lens, because of the stories that they embody, uh, the way that the uh, stories or uh, histories of their people and their lands have poured into them? Um, what does that result in as they encounter the text? So how do uh, those rituals and experiences and stories and life ways and those different identities, how do they create creatively inform what the Bible means for indigenous peoples? And it's that intentional inhabitation of our cultural lenses that um, not only uh, hopefully um, influence us as readers individually and as communities, but also uh, perhaps help shed light on uh, a better understanding of what the text uh, also meant as it encountered the original readers, who in many cases uh, had uh, more collective, uh, I collectivist ideas for in terms of identity um, and were closer, closer to uh, tribal identities as well. And so it's trying to uh, intentionally inhabit those places. And j just a note for Chris and I, and Chris has kind of already hinted at this, um, you know, of this was something that he began to look into uh, because both of us were trained in pr the pretty, you know, pretty traditional Western ways and Western education um, because of the assimilationist policies of Canada and discrimination in Canada. Uh, my my mom and her parents were taught to uh, not feel proud of that uh, heritage and were, uh, you know, were taught by society to, uh, in some ways, hate that part of themselves so that we didn't, you know, we barely talked about it. And so it's only, it's been me and some of my cousins in my current generation, you know, over the past 10 years, that had begun to ask those questions of like, well, what didn't get passed on to us in terms of family tradition, communal tradition? What what are the stories that we didn't learn from our our own oral histories that we should have? And trying to reclaim those, and sometimes that's a task that is not possible because those things uh, died with previous generations and didn't get passed on. Uh, sometimes we're able to uh, find uh, and learn about those things through. Uh, sitting down with elders or family members who may finally talk about it or uh, doing our own research. And in some cases, because there's many different indigenous nations throughout Turtle Island, uh, sometimes it has been uh, a bit of learning from other uh, tribal traditions or cultures um, and kind of stitching together our own uh, cultural identities. So the goal then uh, is to identify and celebrate and advance Indigenous readings of the Bible so that we can power Indigenous Christians for their own theological voices, uh, help them um, embody that well and speak confidently about it. And, and hopefully that will be an enrichment to broader audiences of the global uh, church. So uh, in the end, we hope to produce uh, a couple things that will uh, finally make us millionaires because for some reason we're not making a lot of money in our academic spheres. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I've, something didn't go right there. Um, so we've uh, we've put together uh, this little uh, example here, and uh, we're still early in our project, but um, from discussions we've had with people already, from readings that we've already done, um, we put together this um, uh, indigenous quadrilateral instead of the Wesleyan quadrilateral, as it were, <laughs> uh, but maybe a little bit differently conceived. Um, as we uh, heard from people and how they think about uh, what is authoritative in their lives for indigenous followers of Jesus, um, we feel that they, uh, as they think upon God and Christ and their lives and, and look towards understanding the wisdom that comes from God, they uh, have this constant conversation with a number of, a number of things. The scripture, of course, is a prime component, uh, but so is one's uh, community and culture. Uh, again, those life ways and uh, practices and things like that that come into play. Uh, creation is another large component um, you will quite often hear Chris and I and others, um, instead of using God, quite often we use creator as that reminder. And that's been a tradition 
in our peoples for a long period of time. And it's that reminder of the creative impulse of God and that those things come from his hand and therefore can tell us about uh, the creator then, creator self. And so the creation is looked to um, as uh, a place for uh, wisdom and learning. And then our own uh, hearts and minds or our conscience uh, we see that as uh, given by the creator. Again, it kind of stems from that idea that we are creation as well. And so it can stem from our own hearts and minds as it's formed by these things. And it's a, and it's a circle and it continues to go around and these things mutually inform one another. Um, I will say too, uh, not in the context of hermeneutics, but uh, which is what we're uh, more focused on, but uh, a scholar named Randley Woodley, who some of you may have heard of, uh, he he has used the language of uh, four books, God's four books of scripture, creation, conscience, and then cultural traditions. Um, and that's in a forthcoming book. And I've, uh, you know, so it, it quite aligns with what Chris and I have been thinking here as well. So there's a couple trends that we've identified so far and like I said we are uh, just getting into our project now uh, but the uh, first off this idea that the creator has revealed the creator self to indigenous peoples before their encounter with European missionaries and because that is part of our understanding of ourselves as a people and how the creator has related to our peoples um, you can see why then creation community or in culture uh, becomes places for understanding God and his ways and revelation um, because we don't feel that we were introduced to God when the missionaries came. Um, that, in, that runs counter to uh, certain myths of especially in uh, colonial countries of the origin of those countries whether they be the US, uh, Canada, uh, or Australia, uh, New Zealand, etc., which uh, was coupled with the doctrine of discovery, the idea that the lands were empty uh, of Christian peoples and therefore uh, could be claimed on behalf of uh, Christian nations, and so that you know that's a quite a th uh, thoroughly uh, maybe we can label it as a deistic idea. They believe that God was alive but absent uh, from these lands, as it were. Uh, and these savage peoples who didn't know anything about the creator. And so that's quite counter to how indigenous peoples think of themselves and their relationship and their spirituality. And so when we put that in place, um, in believing that the creator has revealed something of creator self, then uh, that opens up our past histories as well, our, as well as our relationship to the places that the Creator has placed us in order for us to uh, derive wisdom and understanding. Um, we've noticed, or at least um, in our initial readings as we've begun to read from theologians and others, that there uh, tends to be a preference for narrative in terms of actually opening up the scriptural text. There uh, tends to be um, preference for uh, narrative components of the scriptures. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but quite often uh, in Christian circles, it, when we identify with the characters in the scripture, uh, we're quite often the good guys or the group that, that God is supporting. And there are examples in uh, indigenous theologians where uh, they read from the underside, uh, they read from the non-Israelite, and, uh, and that poses important questions for us to think about. There's also, because of uh, more communitarian value sets within indigenous nations, uh, that helps to illuminate uh, those times in the scripture where there's more communitarian understandings of uh, sin, of holiness, of thinking uh, beyond oneself, whereas Western individualism um, certainly colors uh, modern Christian readings of the text. Um, so, you know, Jesus so loved me, uh, you know, you, you can think of uh, examples um, of, uh, you know, gospel sermons or something like that, where they say, you know, put your name there. Uh, God so loved uh, 
Chris that he sent his only son, um, which makes it very individualistic. And it's not that it's untrue in a Christian perspective, but it does say the world, and that's inclusive. That's uh, much larger than just the individual. Um, and then there's uh, there's notable emphasis within uh, existing uh, writings in uh, passages that emphasize the creation, um, uh, how creation is understood. And again, we'll touch on some of those things. Um, and then as well, how uh, those who are on the margins, which again, quite often is those outside of Israel, uh, how those people are interacted with, included or excluded. Chris, start waving frantically at me if I'm going on too long. <clears throat> so um, we, have, we have obviously a complicated identity when we talk about those who are indigenous followers of Jesus. We put indigenous and Christian there, but um, just in case you uh, don't know, and I've, I've said a few times indigenous followers of Jesus, because depending on where you are and the circumstances of uh, people's history with the church, you may have those who are uh, followers of Jesus who will not end, who will not call themselves Christian because it's the Christian church that has decimated their populations or stolen their children and stolen their lands. Um, but uh, so followers of Jesus may be the designation that they use. This uh, picture in the middle here is a picture taken of a little boy named Thomas Moore Kisick. It was a staged photo. It was a photo used by the Department of Indian Affairs in order to show the before and after the good effects of the industrial uh, school that he went to, which was in Regina in Saskatchewan. So uh, the first one on the left, and again, these were staged. Um, you notice he's holding a little gun in his hand. He's possibly wearing uh, traditional female uh, garb rather than male garb. Um, and they're, they're not 100% sure of that. Uh, but the whole point of it was to show, uh, look how we can civilize the savage. And uh, the tragic part of this story uh, is that uh, the first picture was taken at age 8. Um, the, the next one at age 10 or 11. He contracted tuberculosis at age 12, went home and passed away. Um, and it was a year after that that they started using the photo in order to uh, highlight the good that these these schools were doing so you can understand the complicated uh, relationship that even followers of Jesus have uh, with the Christian church uh, in the context of Canada uh, for the second half of the industrial schools or residential schools the churches were uh, the parties that were directly running the schools on the book the book on the left is uh, from Richard Twiss who uh, uh, was a very good friend of Casey. I didn't get the privilege of meeting him, but I've learned much from his writings. Uh, and this is a, a really important book. Uh, and Richard Twiss was one of the founders of NATES, the, uh, the institute we talked about earlier. Uh, and it's a very important work that, again, seeks to uh, celebrate Indigenous identity while remaining uh, within our cultural uh, lifeways. Uh, one quote that he has in there is, uh, why would I give up my sin-stained culture for your sin-stained culture? And yet that's exactly how the gospel was passed on to Indigenous peoples. Chris, do you want to say a little something about Crow Jesus there? Yeah, um, I will also add one other thing about Richard Twist's work is that he opens that work with a story of... Um, an email correspondency he has with an evangelical camp where the uh, meeting grounds where they had been having their um, their family camps at. Uh, I imagine Casey had attended those too. And, and basically they were kicked out. They were said that um, they found out that they were doing sweat lodges. They found out that they were doing ceremonies, indigenous practices, and that these were pagan abominations in effect, and they were not welcome back. And so much of the conversation of the previous generation that's still living with us. I mean, the fight that Casey Church and others have fought has been, can you hold together indigenous customs and traditions and ceremonies and ways of prayer? Um, can you bring that into the church? Can you be Christian and attend a powwow? Can you be Christian and wear traditional indigenous ceremonial clothing? Can you be Christian and, um, and, and sing traditional indigenous hymns in, in the church, right? And, and these have been, 
uh, very unwelcomed in a number of different uh, non-denominational Baptist evangelical uh, contexts that uh, Casey and others have had to stretch themselves to make arguments for their own legitimacy in place. Um, the work that Danny and I do rests on the shoulders of Twist and Church and others. And now for our project, it's saying, let's just assume it's okay. Let's just assume that you can be indigenous and Christian. What else then? What else then does that bring to uh, the table for theological conversation if you start with the postulation that the creator had revealed the creator's self in these ceremonies and traditions and wisdom stories? Uh, and so Crow Jesus, and you can move to the next slide, is a work by Mark Clatterbuck that's been inspiring to me as well. In his, it, It's an ethnographic work of his time spent among the Crow, uh, who noteworthy have this huge sign and have declared officially that Jesus Christ is Lord of the Crow Nation. And in this ethnography, he interviews a, a whole spectrum of individuals showing the various ways uh, in which the crows have responded to this announcement, both from spiritualists and traditionalists who are very skeptical and offended by the statement to um, those in the middle who are trying to, in different ways, to hold together um, their indigenous Christian identities to those who are more fundamentalist or literalist uh, uh, interpreters of the Bible and preachers who are very adamant of um, persuading crows to give up their traditional life ways and games and practices. Uh, and so for my own tribe, it's interesting because as I mentioned, the Chata nation uh, really identifies itself with its, with its Christian heritage, its recent Christian heritage. And we see this both in the cultural center that I recently visited that just got constructed last June. In it, they've reconstructed one of the early churches of Oklahoma in it. Um, and this church is something you walk in and see in its modern section, right? As it walks you through Chata territory and Chata history, this is kind of the culmination of this history that, that we has brought us to today. And at the center of it, next to stickball and next to its other governmental treaty practices, right? You have a church and in the church, you have different uh, um, uh, videos of chiefs and other leaders reading from gospel passages and singing traditional Chata hymns. Uh, and so there's a way in which a number for a number of Chata, there is no um, uh, 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 complication per se, but, but I would also add though, there's a way in which there, I think is still a skepticism uh, toward any kind of thing that might be viewed as syncretism, right? Mixing too much Chakta culture uh, with the Christian faith. And so when you read the, the official chaplain's corner, um, it pretty much, the writings from the chaplain uh, read as basic Baptist or uh, uh, conservative Christian um, teachings on um, Easter or whatever given topic, right? But there's not a clear way in which the, the indigenous culture and stories are, are, are being brought to bear in the conversation with one another, right? Um, so uh, we can go to the next slide. So what if we treat our ancestral traditions, ceremonies, and cultural teachings as rich treasure troves of wisdom that came from the creator? And you can keep moving along the lines here. Uh, what if this is our Chata or our Cree covenant? Uh, one of the, the wise statements of Stephen Charleston um, in Four Vision Quests of Jesus, he talks about um, what if we thought about our own traditions and heritage as our own Old Testament, that across the world, everyone has their own Old Testament or their own ancient covenant with creator, which is inspired by wisdom of the ancestors, uh, that that's useful for thinking about making meaning of our life today. Uh, and next. So, one way in which this might be helpful and one way in which I, I've seen this at work within the work of Stephen Charleston and others, right, is to reclaim certain kinds of stories and storytelling motifs that are at home within indigenous traditions and practices. So one motif uh, we might think about is the, the trickster motif or within ceremonial practices, uh, you have the, the holy fools or the kashare among the Pueblo traditions or the sacred clowns or the Hayoka amongst the Plains traditions like the Lakota, um, where you have different figures 
who are troubling the waters per se, who are getting into trouble, but by following their misfortunes, by seeing the ways in which they trouble dichotomies and um, do things that are unexpected, maybe even do things that are offensive, that new wisdom and insights are brought to bear or they become invitations to reflect on our present moment. Uh, so one way in which Stephen Charlson has brought this out is to think about John the Baptist as a kind of holy fool or, or sacred clown, someone who stands in contrast to the historical Jesus insofar as John the Baptist's message is one of destruction and wrath of the coming kingdom of God is coming and everyone's going to get destroyed if you don't repent right now. And uh, uh, this stands in contrast to a related but slightly different message that uh, Jesus of Nazareth seems to be giving in the gospel lessons, such that then in the gospel traditions, you have this moment where John the Baptist writing from prison is writing to Jesus and be like, hey, I'm in prison. If there's any point that you want to kind of get me out of here and like start the revolution and start bringing God's fire and brimstone, that would be great because I'm about to be killed. And Jesus effectively says, look, go back to the scripture. Aren't I doing all the things that one in my position should do? Uh, blessed are you if you don't stumble and if you don't lose your faith in this tradition, because uh, I'm not living up to the idea that you have of what someone who is anointed, someone who is this uh, uh, Messiah is supposed to be. Um, but that but the John who is wearing these um, the camel skin and eating locusts, right, there's these highly performative um, actions that are meant to disrupt and to uh, get ourselves out of our uh, uh, status quo complacency, right? Something thinking about the Greco-Roman traditions, right? Might be akin to these cynics who do these disruptive social performances to make you question the kind of lifestyle that you're living, right? Um, seems akin to some of the actions that we see Kashari is doing in, in ceremonies going around making offensive gestures or uh, making fun of audience and participant members in these uh, traditions or uh, a sacred clown like my friend uh, Mark Ravenhair who uh, uh, performs this uh, Hayoka duty in Sundance rituals uh, uh, that a very solemn event where he is the one um, laughing and egging on people right um, but, but, but in, in some sense, they're, they're chaos factors. And how might this be a helpful way of thinking about different characters that we read in scripture and see in scripture to maybe see them in a new light? Uh, you know, one, one story that I've been thinking about is the story of Jesus talking with the Syrio-Phoenician woman, which is a troubling story insofar as Jesus is on vacation, basically. He goes to the garrison, or he, he goes to, to the, the land of the Gentiles uh, away from Judea to kind of take a break. And he checks into his hotel and uh, there's a woman, a Syria Phoenician or according to Matthew, a Canaanite woman who comes to him and says, my, my daughter is sick and uh, I, she's possessed by a demon. Can you help her? And the response seems to be, a, in, according to modern terms, a, a relatively racist response. He says, look, I was sent to the children of Israel. Is it right for... Uh, uh, me to give food that was meant for the children of Israel to dogs. And she responds, well, even dogs get crumbs. And Jesus says, well, uh, by your words and your faithfulness, your daughter is healed. Um, those within the African-American tradition, especially uh, uh, Mitzi Smith have pointed to this and said, oh, this is a, this is a wonderful interpretation from a womanist perspective to lift up, to lift up womanist sass, right? This woman speaks back to, to Jesus and corrects Jesus. And I want to read this in terms of Sandra Bland. It's a fantastic piece that Missy e. Smith has written. Um, in resonance with that, I also wonder, from an indigenous perspective, could we read this as Jesus being the chaotic sacred clown or the holy fool who's saying something offensive or is saying or who is laying out the logic of ethnocentric hierarchies that were present within the Jewish mindset, within the ancient Israelite and, and just Roman mindset. All, I mean, I, I have a whole article on ethnic hierarchies in the Roman world. Everybody was listed in some kind of pecking order. And uh, uh, by saying this offensive statement, by living out this and saying out to its logical conclusion, right, uh, it provides an opportunity for the woman to speak back and for the spotlight and the teaching to be present in her, for her to, to voice out her own faith to, to voice out in her own and to claim her own justice as Missy e. Smith talks about. Um, I think there's powerful, something powerful to think about with that. Uh, 
And that's it. What we have here is a famous uh, trickster tale. It's kind of a trickster tale within the Chakta tradition. Um, Why Rabbit Has a Short Tail. Uh, and in this story, uh, Chukfi, Rabbit, uh, long story short, used to have a long tail, uh, talks to Trickster Fox, who basically says, hey, you know, I'm catching all these fish by sticking my tail in an ice lake. And if you do the same thing, you're going to catch tons of fish. Well, Rabbit does so, and he sticks his tail into a frozen pond. Uh, his butt freezes to the ground. And then as he pulls his butt out of the, the, the lake, he loses his long tail and now has a short tail. What's interesting about this is it's a pretty simple story. And it's a story that is meant to give us the origin for why a rabbit has a short tail. But when you look at a number of Chakta retellings of this story, uh, it's all moralized differently. And one example is actually uh, this gift shop book that uh, I picked up for my own kids at the Chata gift store. Um, and you can see how it, uh, 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 it's been moralized even in a Christian sense. At the very end of the back of the book, it says, um, in case you needed a moral lesson from the story, do unto others as you would have do unto them. And, and the final scene is the mama bunny giving the baby bunny a, a hug and says, sometimes we need hugs. But in other traditional Chata stories, right? It's been that this is why you don't talk too much. This rabbit was talking his mouth off, annoy the fox, and the fox basically tricked him just to not be annoyed by this rabbit who doesn't want to do a lot of work, right? Um, but that said, right, this indigenous openness of stories, the stories can change and meanings can change based on the retellings and the setting of it, right, is I think an actually really helpful way of thinking about oral traditions. And it, it certainly wasn't a kind of way in which stories were presented to me in my, my church upbringing or even somewhat biblical studies where, you know, you try to find the original version of a parable, original story of Jesus, or what did it mean in its original context? And that might be a fool's quest insofar as even as we see in Matthew and Luke, right? That they tell these stories in different ways and they moralize these stories in different ways. And scholars wring their hands over figuring out what that meaning is. But from an indigenous perspective, right? You don't, um, there, there's this wisdom that you leave these stories open-ended and that the meanings that stick with you are the meanings in some sense that you construct yourself from these open stories. Uh, uh, next slide. So as Danny alluded to um, in indigenous, traditions and some indigenous readings of the Bible, indigenous people have not always saw themselves in the position of Israel. So within the larger history of maybe liberation theology that's come out of South America and African American readings of the Bible, right? The Exodus is the go-to story to talk about God's preferential option for the poor, that God cares about the liberation of those who are enslavement and those who are oppressed. And uh, uh, especially, especially within the African-American tradition, we see this in uh, uh, James Cone and other writers, right? The Exodus plays a really powerful symbolic story to talk about God's salvation and God's walking through and suffering with the people he's bringing out of oppression. Uh, Robert Warrior, in his work, um, uh, Canaanites, Cowboys, and Indians, leads us to think about the story more holistically. Because what happens at the end of Exodus, right? The people of Israel are liberated from Pharaoh. They go now to the wilderness and are preparing to take over the promised land. A promised land like the Americas, not an uninhabited land, right? It is a land that is filled with Canaanites that are a problem. And it's these Canaanites then indigenous people to the land who are, are murdered and genocided in mass, according to some retellings of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and Robert Warrior talks about, uh, or quote, he says, do indigenous people, quote, dare trust the same God in their struggle for justice? As long as people believe in a Yahweh of deliverance, the world will not be safe from Yahweh the conqueror. And uh, do we see ourselves in the place of the Canaanites. Certainly, if you look at American colonial history, right, all the Puritans who came over, a number of the early uh, uh, ministers from Colin Mather and others, when they're talking about indigenous people, right, the indigenous people of the Americas are the Canaanites. And this kind of theology leads into 
the manifest destiny and also the doctrine of discovery, right? That indigenous people don't count as real people. When Christians come to the land, it is their God-given right to own the property, to own the land. And even according to the doctrine of discovery established uh, uh, by the Pope, uh, uh, Nicholas in the, in the 15th, 16th century, and then as operated by Spain, right? You can even enslave these indigenous people um, because they're not Christian. And uh, so, so this has had a uh, horrible, terrible legacy for indigenous people, right? And, and telling the story, right? And, and then, uh, well, let me say, telling the story provides an opportunity to recount history and to share a, of other stories, right? Um, I will say this is not the last word. Um, others will have responded to warrior within the tradition, including William Baldridge, who again goes back to this Canaanite story that I just told you um, and reads Jesus as repenting before the Canaanite woman and healing her daughter and saying that if we Canaanites live out our faith, then maybe we too, like the Canaanite woman, can change the heart of God and maybe even Christians too. So, uh, but again, what we see in these examples is this really rich way in which stories are juxtaposed from the indigenous tradition and history with the stories of the Bible as there is this mutual conversation and uh, uh, meaning making that, that is occurring. Next, next slide. So one of the pieces I'm working on right now is thinking about the place of dreams and visions within indigenous traditions and history and the way in which coming to the scripture with an indigenous worldview and eyes helps to appreciate the, the sheer abundance of stories and narratives that center dreams and visions as the crucial element of the story in of itself, right? As not just this crucial element of the story, but as a crucial element of the way in which people are communicating with divine. Um, uh, a, a, a kind of epist divine epistemology or theological epistemology that you know, we could identify as present with modern day Pentecostals um, but largely in more conservative, uh, scripture-oriented, evangelical and conservative churches, right? Uh, the emphasis is always on scripture being, the, and a literal reading of scripture, is the safest and most secure way of having communications with the divine or interpreting divine communication. And all other forms of prophecy and oracles and visions have basically stopped since the closing of the canon. Um, but when we think of indigenous history and something that Stephen Charleston brings up too, right? We've got these legacies of Wovoka and Black Elk and Sweet Medicine among the Cheyenne, uh, Tecumseh's brother. Um, I mean, the list goes on from the early 19th century when we have, you know, a really solid ethnographic work on indigenous communities, even to the present uh, um, interviews that Danny are having with some of our indigenous contexts. There is this rich way in which uh, a lot of indigenous people are in reading the Bible in conversation with dreams that they're having and, uh, and thinking about how the Bible is one source of divine communication uh, that is in conversation, uh, without trying to draw a hierarchy here, um, is in conversation with the kind of spiritual commu communication that people are having within their dreams and visions. Uh, as a biblical scholar, um, one of the stories I'm interested in is in particular the story of Paul, right? When we look at Paul's hermeneutics and use of scripture, Paul of Tarsus, for whom uh, we accredit, you know, most of the letters within the New Testament, uh, when we get down to what is the origin of Paul's gospel, Paul wasn't a disciple of Jesus. And according to Acts, Paul's and, and, and probably more reliably, according to Galatians, Paul talks about the origin of his gospel ultimately coming from a dream vision that he has of Jesus. In Galatians, he's adamant that he did not get his gospel from any man or human authority. He downplays any relevance that Peter or James had in the so-called pillars of the church who uh, uh, may have informed or, or given and handed down his gospel. He won't say, no, 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 my gospel comes directly from Jesus. So how did he meet Jesus? How does he know Jesus? Well, he ultimately knows Jesus through visions. And this is a part of the Christian story, Christian heritage, that I think is obscured or occluded from um, a kind of uh, 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 white Eurocentric reading 
that has the post enlightenment kind of elevates um, rational discourse and reading and scriptural interpretation, right? Uh, and what we find is that Paul's gospel that um, Gentiles, non Jews, do not have to practice kosher laws, do not have to um, be circumcised, right? Has very little clear scriptural justification. Like Paul is not going to the Hebrew Bible and thinking, okay, I'm reading this, I'm going to study it, and oh, it comes clear from my reading the Hebrew Bible that Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. No, largely it seems that this message is coming from a vision that Paul has had, and that he goes to the Hebrew Bible as a kind of justification practice, as a proof texting, of trying to figure out and finding um, uh, hints in it that, that might help inform and justify the thing that he sees live both in his ministry and in, as evidence of the fruits of the spirit that he's seeing in Titus and Timothy and others, but, but also justifying the vision and message that he's getting from Jesus. And we also kind of see a similar arc happen in the way that Luke describes the origination of this message in Acts, where he, he puts the origin within Peter and Cornelius, both starting out with individual visions that they get confirmed by um, manifestations or theophanies of uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, all this to say, right, the intervention I'm interested in making and thinking about is the way in which um, an indigenous lens helps us to appreciate what's always been there is the presence of um, visions and dreams as being uh, uh, potent and possible avenues for divine communications that um, disrupts a kind of religiosity or, or, or practice that uh, uh, centers so strongly a kind of uh, only Bible interpretation or, or that preeminently focuses on biblical interpretation and it kind of poo-poos or, or looks down on any other kinds of things. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in here, Chris. Um, jump in. Yeah, yeah. An example of uh, from our own. So I don't know if we made it clear when we were talking about the project, but uh, we're biblical scholars, so you know we're used to just having our noses in books, but we're we're branching out into uh, you know ethnographic work and appreciative inquiry and things like that, and so we're doing interviews with people. Um, and just as an example of the visions and dreams, so I I interviewed someone who, you know, would be a very conservative evangelical <laughs> Christian. Um, he wouldn't really you know, put emphasis uh, or importance on cultural reclamation or, you know, using cultural practices. But yet, as I uh, interviewed with, interviewed him and have a, had a great conversation, he kind of just casually several times slipped in these. And then I had a vision or then I had a dream and the creator said this to me. And so, and, and it's like, and then I had an entire life change. <laughs> um, and it was just very interesting to me that, and I kind of pointed out to him, I said, do you realize that most people wouldn't do that? You know, many, many Christians would question it, say, oh, you know, I just ate something funny last night and that's why I had a dream. Um, or they would say, I need to submit this to the scriptures or whatever it might be. And yet you uh, very comfortably um, said, this is, this is directly from the creator. Um, and, and then it caused you to make significant life choices uh, in what you were going to do. And so, you know, that was an example, I think, of, uh, you know, someone who I think, uh, whether or not he realizes it, um, acts in certain ways because of his cultural heritage, um, even as he, he, you know, is more of a, embodies that kind of whitewashed uh, Indigenous Christian. Um, Chris, just for sake of time, I'm going to skip down to uh, the creation and kingdom. Okay. I was, look at that. I was about to say the same exact thing. Um, yeah. I will know this is going to touch to you, to your work on creation, right? Um, one of the things that Stephen Charleston and others have talked about, right, is thinking about Jesus' time as in the wilderness in terms of Lakota spiritual vision quests and, uh, uh, and, and fitting kind of the arc of essential elements that we see within the village in quest of uh, a time for purification, a time for physical challenge, a time for lament and receiving some kind of vision where one's identity is affirmed, um, but that identity is always something not just for your own aggrandizement, but it's something in the service of a larger community. And uh, 
I can't emphasize enough how beautiful it is to see uh, Stephen Charleston kind of walk through these kind of arcs of uh, movements of a spiritual vision quest and then read it back to the Jesus uh, uh, wilderness experience. Um, but that's going to tie into creation as well, because creation has a place within the Jesus uh, vision quest as well. So baton to you, Danny. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned before, how creation is part of that kind of indigenous hermeneutical circle, as it were. And uh, one of the things that uh, indigenous uh, peoples do is, again, they uh, see us as part of creation, uh, not above creation in a, in a hierarchical way, but rather reliant upon creation. And so um, I'll touch on the Matthew uh, component in a second, but um, for those of you who recall Genesis 1 and 2, um, the very first chapter split in the Bible is at a very terrible spot uh, because the seven-day story isn't even done yet and we get to chapter 2. Um, but the, the, first, the first seven days of creation, um, the transition verse is chapter 2, verse 4. And um, for those of you who know Hebrew, uh, the word that's used there is toledoth, which is generations um, or sometimes genealogical record, depending on your translation. Um, but just as uh, uh, probable and as even mentioned in uh, some of the uh, lexicons is that the word essentially is talking about a family tree, your genealogical record, your family tree. Uh, and yet the it talks about this is the family tree of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In other words, all those things that have been created in those seven days all have this family relationship. And indigenous speak, uh, people speak of creation in this way as being part of it. And not only being part of it, but uh, being reliant upon it. So again, uh, the common... Uh, readings is that we sit as the as the the crown of creation um the pinnacle of creation whereas indigenous folks would look at genesis 1 and say well we're created last because we're reliant on all of those other things we're the needy ones um and so that places us in a different uh in a different relationship with the creation as opposed to being uh, the crown of creation as it were and in Genesis 2, as we move into the story that's focused on Adam and Eve um, and their placement in the garden, the language uh, within uh, used in Genesis 2, and I'm being very quick, uh, I've done uh, more detailed writing on this, but the language in the garden is one of, again, reliance and this reciprocity with the garden and the land where uh, we both serve the land and we receive gifts back from the land in this case food and so there's this reciprocitous uh, relationship that's established rather than again this hierarchical uh, hierarchical relationship and so these are examples of again me learning from my own cultural heritage and uh, from other indigenous uh, wisdom and um and worldviews, and then going back to the scripture and saying, well, how how maybe would I read this differently uh, as an indigenous person? And uh, another component to that, just to go back to the conquest story, the Exodus and the conquest, um, something else that indigenous people have done in that story is say, well, what if the land itself is a character in that story as well? So we say it's God, Israel, and the Canaanites, and indigenous Focal, what if it's God, Israel, the Canaanites, and the land? Uh, if the land is a character there um, in which God, uh, the creator, cares about and will defend if he feels it's being polluted, misused, or whatever. And indeed, that is what we see. We have language like that of, um, and warning Israel, if you act the same way, I'm going to spew you out. He actually uses the word vomit. I'm going to vomit you out. Um, if you are going to pollute the land as well, and then reminding them that actually uh, you don't own this land. I'm not giving you a title deed. Um, rather, I'm the creator of this place and I'm the owner of this place. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, 
touch upon Genesis 1 2 there, but uh, Romans 8 is another uh, example of a text that you will, as you read indigenous theologians, is frequently gone back to. So you remember how I said there's this, uh, there's this preference for creation centric texts. And Romans 8 uh, is a beautiful example and a good example of the scripture using maternal language for the creation, um, which very much aligns with how many people indigenous, how many indigenous people describe uh, earth as mother earth, um, language that I uh, will intentionally use to make white people feel uncomfortable. Um, and then I can just remind them that it's in Romans 8. And so I'm in good company. And then uh, Matthew 4, which uh, he mentioned, but it would not only be Matthew 4, but just the other, uh, the other stories of the temptation in the wilderness. But I would say the narrative of the Gospels as a whole, where Jesus is intentionally focused on a particular land and place, the injustices that happen in a land and space, and the work to redeem uh, places and peoples. Um, as opposed to our very uh, individual salvation uh, type of understanding, uh, but rather it being more holistic. And uh, as you look at the uh, examples in uh, Matthew and the Gospels, uh, Mark in particular talks about how uh, the, the wild animals are out in the desert with Jesus. Um, and why have that little note unless it means that there's some sort of harmony because wild animals and beasts in the desert, these were scary places uh, for people, right? It was dangerous to be in those places. And yet Jesus seems to be chumming up to the wild animals out in the wilderness. Um, and then just to add as well, specifically uh, for Matthew, if you were to look at the Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, right before the temptation is the baptism, and at the baptism, uh, the Holy Spirit comes down, uh, but the Holy Spirit is a dove. And so what does it mean then? Because we, we tend to think of incarnation as the unique uh, incarnation of the Son uh, as a human being, but yet we have this story of the Holy Spirit incarnating himself into creation in this particular moment and where he becomes a bird. And there's a, a, a great scholar that I... Uh, recommend his name's mark wallace he just recently wrote this book when god was a bird um so it's a, a bit of a pneumatology uh, and he's done several books uh, similar to that and uh, so the thing to note in mark even though we have a subtitle you have a subtitle on all your bibles between the temptation uh, between the baptism and the temptation um as soon as uh that that uh, story of the heavens opening up and god speaking and the holy spirit coming down upon him and then the next verse says that the spirit led him into the desert and the spirit has just incarnated uh, spirit self into a dove form. And so um, the picture that Matthew has drawn for us is that Jesus is now following a bird out into the wilderness. Um, it's not, it's not a uh, internal inclination that the spirit is telling me to go this way, but uh, rather it is a uh, nature manifestation. And we know uh and I don't need to say too much that Jesus' parables uh, frequently use horticultural uh, examples. But uh, one thing I do want to say from Jesus' parables is that there's only a few times that Jesus actually explains his parables. Um, there are a couple that have explanations. There are, uh, are many more that don't. And that le lends to what Chris said before of uh, the polyvalent nature of stories in indigenous uh, ways of telling stories, which I think the parables hold as well. Um, that there was no uh, single interpretation for many of these, rather uh, within the Gospels, and it's expected as they continue to be told um, that they will encounter a person in a time and place, um, and they will come to their understanding of how this parable may apply in these particular spaces. And uh, just one last thing to say about stories, again, in Indigenous storytelling, sometimes uh, you may go for many years without uh, no, without someone ever explicating a story. Rather, you just encounter, encounter the story as the story. Um, and quite often it's left up to you to say, how does this apply to me? And only occasionally are stories more explicated. And again, it's exactly what we see in Jesus' own life. And this is how stories worked uh, in indigenous culture. <laughs>
So well, Chris, I think we're, little, I mean, we have more, I was afraid of like not having enough today. Um, and we have, we have tons of unused slides, but I think yeah. we'll call that a day for now. And get, we have 20 more minutes, I believe for questions and um, happy to talk more about any one of these slides. Yeah, and I'll just say one more thing. Um, uh, we mentioned Nate's a few times. Nate's does have a journal as well. Uh, so the journal of Nate's and uh, you likely or possibly have access to the ATLA database. It's in the ATLA database. Uh, if not, you can go to nates.com and it is uh, it can be purchased there. So that comes out of our annual symposium, uh, which then the papers are are published. Thank you both. Thanks to Chris, thanks to Danny. Without further ado, I turn the floor over to Richard, who has a question. Oh, I just wanted to thank you for um, um, explaining your your research on dreams and visions. You know, because in um, in African American Christian traditions, we have um, you know like a a lot of people who have um, dreams and visions, um, and that goes back to um, you know periods of an of enslavement. Mm -hmm. And also I've had I have people in my family who've had accurate dreams and visions that that predict future events that occur in our family. But we're unable usually to um, you know to have a discussion with either our you know, our black Protestant um, ministers or black Catholic priests about dreams and visions you know they just completely dismiss this as you know something that um you know means you need to rest or there's something wrong with you and oftentimes i think that african americans you know have dreams and visions which are accurate that actually occur within um your family network in the future turn to um people in our communities who are uh, initiated in African indigenous traditions. Hmm. So um, I, I very much appreciate your, uh, you know, your uh, kind of um, biblical explanation of, of uh, you know, validating the significance of, of dreams and visions. Yeah. And it, it doesn't stop there. I mean, as sure as Paul can talk about, right, the monastic tradition, I mean, Tertullian in the early church has a whole um, text, the Diana on the spirit that, uh, uh, is about the validity and power of dreams in the Christian tradition, right? So th there is this long, uh, uh, tradition that the Christians in their Greco-Roman context that largely talked about dreams and visions, right. And, um, both in, in positive ways and in problematic ways, uh, uh, it keeps going, right. It's, it's largely this kind of modern post enlightenment turn, uh, um, and, and fundamentalist kind of turn that's that centered on kind of the discourse of scriptural interpretation that has largely, uh, you know, it's, it cast a side eye against this, but within African American, uh, like, as you mentioned, and Pentecostal, a number of the traditions, right. Uh, Hispanic traditions as well. They're, they're, there's a much more freer conversation and curiosity about the overlap and, and the significant continuing significance of these experiences. The final thing I'll say on that is, um, my interpretation of this as an African-American Christian is that um, a, num a number of our um, religious leaders who are biblically trained either and, and ordained either as Protestants or Catholics have not had, they've not had mm -hmm. dreams and visions. Mm -hmm. So they actually um, don't have any, you know, where to place that within a, a valid, you know, Christian religious experience. Mm. That's my off the, the wall reading of of, yeah. of, of of those phenomena in African American Christian. Yeah, you know, just just to add one thing too, and I don't know that this is actually more of a question. Maybe one of you guys can answer this for me, but um, I I have wondered about uh, cessationism in the context of the growth of the global church from very early on. If it was actually a means of suppressing other understandings of of Creator's revelation with people. Uh, in other words, as as you co claim that God only speaks in this one way now, um, then it's up to well, those who know those things um, 
to be to be in charge of its interpretation. Are we moderating, Chris? Julie. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm just like nodding like a bobblehead because I was exactly thinking that exact same thing. So thank you so much for this marvelous talk. My head is spinning with thoughts and questions and comments. And like, I feel like you did dipped into a hundred things that each could be a book. Um, but the one question I have, and I totally think you're right, but I'm asking this question to like, uh, help solidify my own thinking about it more than to um, argue um, but so is if if Christianity if God can reveal himself through indigenous culture then it then follows that he can be without Israel or uh, a direct connection to to Judaism then it thus follows that he might have uh, revealed himself through other religions and cultures as well and so uh do you think that's the case that he has like through all religions and cultures or only some and if all then how is this different or is it not different from like a universalist thing where all religions are passed to god um yeah yeah. I, I think I misspoke. Um, I didn't mean all indigenous cultures. I meant mostly the Chata. Um, it's <laughs> awkward because I don't think God's revealed himself to the Cree. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll pass the baton to you, Danny. <laughs> well, that's all you were going to say on it. <laughs> oh, I got um, other words. I got other words. I just, I'm very self-satisfied with my joke. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a good, it's a good question. I, I think, um, you know, certainly in the context of uh, what we have uh, been exploring and reading, um, we have been focused on those who uh, consider themselves to be followers of Jesus. And so then asking the question, how does that how does that change or not change how you engage with your own culture and practice and life ways, etc.? And and so it's within that that we've seen that they 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 don't just say, okay, I'm all done. Although that's what we were taught. Right. So like my grandparents, when they became believers, they were taught, you know, indigenous culture is, is demonic and you need to forsake all of that. Um, and, and be this way. Right. And so, um, but you find, you, you find indigenous people. Uh, so I have a, a good friend here, uh, who's a Mi'kmaq woman and, the way that uh, she encountered the gospel and became a believer uh, was not at all. It, there was no European cultural baggage with it. And it, whereas she became a follower of Jesus, she's still very much a, a Mi'kmaq woman uh, who lives in her Mi'kmaq worldview and, and life ways. And so, and so you, you see those differences in how we encounter. Um, uh, Casey uh, Church here, he has uh, an article in the Journal of Nates, um, and I just remember a quote, you know, essentially where he says, you know, we are the ones that know best our cultures, and so let us, as we encounter Christ and the gospel, make the decision for how our culture informs our faith, rather than you authoritative, you know, coming in and telling us what you think about it, let us wrestle and struggle with it as a community together and work through those things. And so uh, all of that to say that the indigenous uh, Christians that I've read and encountered don't, uh, don't wholesale say everything about everything that I've learned from my culture and heritage is all good. Um, but rather it becomes this engagement um, and it sometimes means uh, uh, certain things that are not as important anymore in practice, it sometimes means that something that we did do is imbued with much more understanding and richness as it's then adopted into our cultural practices. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is, uh, as you would probably know, because I, uh, from the way you asked the question, but uh, quite often, you know, if I'm asked it more pointedly than what you did, um, I would say I'm okay with answering that kind of question as long as you're okay with answering that kind of question as an American or Canadian who just assumes that your cultural practices are all okay as well. 
Um, so we need to have that critical engagement, whatever our culture is, whatever our practices are. I guess not, not wonderful job, Danny, not to put all the work on you. Um, you know, with this project where we have a lot of hats on, right? We're, we are trained as biblical scholars. I'm also trained in the broader just study of religion and classical religions as well. Um, but we are also kind of donning hats as his, cultural historians and even ethnographers, right? So, you know, we there's multiple different kinds of statements we can make here. Um, but from, I, I, will, I will also say just as a reader of historian, right? Like, you know, one person we've come across who's really important for our story is George Tink Tinker. And in one of his uh, uh, articles that I, 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 I really appreciate and love is, thinking about Jesus and corn mother, right? What might putting Jesus and corn mother together in conversation elucidate and help us to think about the Christian tradition? Um, because there's many ways in which the sacrifice that corn mother does is she gives her body, her blood, her life to the soil that then creates corn that recreates that, that basically saves the nation that saves the people um, has a lot of thematic overlaps um, to life giving love to the story of Jesus. And so you know, one of the things he posits is that, you know, if we're going to speak within the Christian discourse, right, and take seriously the idea of pre Jesus's pre existence and the, the identity, the logos, wisdom that pervades, that informs all society that goes out to the world, could we, can we see logos? Can we see wisdom, right? Wisdom in the feminine set, you know, feminine form, right? Uh, um, manifest and be present within the story of Corn Mother. And might that also then speak us and help us imagine, um, you know, different ways of thinking about Jesus' atonement and sacrifice, because in indigenous traditions, at least those that celebrate corn mother, right, the sacrifice isn't meant to placate um, wrath, right, that that blood has to be given for God to forgive you, right, that's not a um, at-home discourse for for these tribes. So, uh, I mean, this is, Pan this really, we are opening Pandora's box to a number of questions that have been answered over time many different ways. So, um, some would say yes, some would say no, you know, um, I could take you, you know, get to ask me out for a beer for my own personal theology. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's a fantastic question, Julia, Julia. I'll, yes. Yeah, no, I like how you turned it back because I've been thinking about that in that way for a while of like, think of the Christmas tree. We don't even try to come up with a story of how it's related to the Christmas story. We don't even try. And yet we don't have any problem with it. And I, I actually don't think it's problematic. So if the Christmas tree is fine, where it's just, you know, a thing we do for no particular reason, but we like it, then how can that be better than any other cultural practices that are adopted into Christian traditions? Yes. Casey, uh, were you going to say something too to follow up on that? Yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good responses there. Um, it, am I under the impression this is mostly a dialogue for, to help you guys uh, do what you're doing? Uh, I don't know how many indigenous North Americans there are here, besides you, you and I, and and Chris. I think we're holding down the fort, Casey. I think yeah. it's just us three. <laughs> okay, could be wrong though. All right. Yeah. Well. I read the scripture in a way because I'm a practitioner. You know, I got my degree in missiology. So I'm being an indigenous missiologist working on indigenous church planting. I read the scripture in a way that helps me do just exactly what she says. Uh, Native American churches across the country have Christmas trees in their sanctuaries rather than anything that connects them with new life and, and rebirth and those kind of things of they more or less look at uh, the time you know, of change when the solstice happens. It's a time of, you know, God is renewing his world and not anything to do with the Christmas tree, an Easter rabbit that really confuses a lot of Native American people that we do have our own understandings of renewal and new life that need to be incorporated, but not have ever given the opportunity to explore those within any context because we have been uh, the hegemony of making Native people accept and assimilate to the white Western way of Christianity has always been the dominant form. And good medicine way is uh, breaking away and, and 
getting into those, those topics and, and how do we do that here in Albuquerque with a city that has like about 127 different nations here just in Albuquerque with a population of 147,000, I mean 47,000 natives that live in Albuquerque city limits. So we're, uh, how do you do that? And then transition all these different uh, tribal traditions. Uh, we have come to the point that we are doing something in, in conjunction with a very consensus-based uh, acceptance and you know decision-making process that we'll do some things that are very pan-tribal and we really, we're careful about walking them through with our native people because there's so many protocols that we could break and hinder the gospel's message in our, in our tradition here because we might take our liberty uh, too freely and say that, oh, because my old church has a Christmas tree, we're gonna bring that into this, this way and we're gonna use it in this fashion without even knowing why we use the Christmas tree in our, in our setting. Uh, when we do have other things. So we are exploring all different kinds of ways. You know, speaking of the topic of visions, my whole ministry was based on vision. You know, 32 years ago, having a vision that set the direction of my life. And I'm 65 now, so I've been doing you know, contextual ministry for half of my life now. And uh, dreams and visions are so important, but we haven't given the Native people the time and expression to, to bring those things that they understand about creator into the church world because uh, you, they know they're going to get knocked down because, you know, who believes in that kind of stuff? You know, yeah, we do. We believe in that kind of stuff because our Bible tells us that dreams and visions are important and they guide our lives. So I could go on and on, but I just wanted to share a little bit there. Thanks, Roger? Roger? Thank you. I, I just wanted to offer an appreciation. I'm the vicar of Church of the Holy Apostles in Oneida, Wisconsin, on the Oneida Indian Reservation. And uh, two things that, that you mentioned in the course of your conversation um, resonated with our recent experience uh, bringing the remains of three children home from the Carlisle Indian School here mm -hmm. to Oneida so that they could be uh, reunited uh, with their relatives. Um, when we arrived at Carlisle, uh, Sonny Hill, who is the Oneida Longhouse practitioner uh, accompanying the, the group, um, offered a prayer to Mother Earth. You know, and you mentioned you know, the, how the Mother Earth language for many Christians is jarring language, uh, but Sonny offered the, the most beautiful prayer to Mother Earth, um, asking her forgiveness for disturbing the rest of the children, but promising that it would be only temporary until we could return her, uh, and, you know, their remains back at home in Oneida. Um, but in in one of the prayer services that I offered, I uh, pointed to the story of Joseph in exile in Egypt, asking that his bones be taken out of Egypt and back to the land when the Israelites returned to the land. Uh, and so there were resonances in a couple of different directions in this extremely poignant experience, this uh, you know, very powerful moment. Uh, we have a second group of Oneida families that will be returning to Carlisle this summer to bring the remains of two more children home. Um, but I so appreciate your, your insights and your observations. Um, also appreciate your uh, reconnecting to Stephen Charleston, a group of us indigenous Episcopalians also read uh, Stephen Charleston's Four Vision Quests uh, last year as our pandemic book club. <laughs> mm -hmm. So again, thank you all very much. This has been a really enlightening and, and inspiring conversation. Yeah. I think we're almost out of time, but Jenna has her hand up. I made last question and then um, everyone can go off to their meetings and such, but <laughs> thank you so much again for this time. And Ro thank you so much for sharing that, Roger. Really appreciate that. And may I'll come out and visit y'all sometime from Iowa. I hope so. Couldn't we just all stay and talk for another hour? I feel like, I feel like we could. <laughs>
Um, so I'm Janice Montgomery. I'm a faculty member here in religious studies and also in communication studies. And I work mostly in religion and media. And I'm so excited about your talk in part because um, I've recently been doing some writing about uh, the relationship between infrastructure and settler colonialism, um, focusing largely on oil, but also educational infrastructure and things like that. Um, so there's a lot here that's exciting to me, but I have um, a, a kind of broader question maybe about um, how you're imagining your work being received. Because one of the things that struck me as you were talking um, is how much your work upends the categories that academia takes for granted. There were moments that were way more God talk than I'm used to, um, uh, way more theological. And then there were moments where, um, like your use of Robert Warrior's text, you, you sidestep the kind of Christian, Christian ap apologia that marks theological work. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, I could, I could see this being thought of as biblical interpretation. I get thought of it being biblical studies. I can think of it as North American religions. Are, do you encounter that confusion of boundaries as you imagine this work, as your work is received? And, and then what do you do with that as scholars? Is it productive? Is it a challenge? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I, the, there are a lot of hats that I recognize that I'm wearing. And almost as I tell this project to different communities, right? I put on, I'll, I'll, I'll wear one hat longer than other hats. Um, and, and particularly because I, I think that's reflective of also the training I've had, you know, all my training has been at largely religiously diverse secular institutions. And so in many ways, I'm much more trained as a, a scholar of secular religion in some ways, rather than formed in a Christian institution of theology. Um, and yet what I see my work doing is, um, of, of jumping around between largely biblical studies and thinking about collecting um, and, and, and trying to catalog and collect all that's been written because there have been, Danny, I recognize that there have been really wonderful and beautiful in, indigenous exegesis of biblical texts, but they're all kind of scattered in the winds and all these small little one-off essays, you know, uh, uh, Jason mentioned a even foreword that uh, Mickling had written, right? So um, there hasn't been, a lot of sustained works beyond even uh, Stephen Charleston. So in one sense, I have my biblical studies hat. And when I talk about Paul in, in historical critical studies, I'll, I'll, I could put my biblical studies hat on. Um, but also recognizing largely the ways in which indigenous uh, people are not represented in the academy. They're not being credentialed. They're not being, um, you know, the, the, there is really good work happening on the ground that's living um, in life. And, you know, and actually one of the, the, Casey, if you don't mind me talking about one of our inner first conversations, I think one thing that was illuminates me was I was like, Casey, do you have any sermons that you can like send me? I would love to just read your sermons and your texts. And Casey just kind of looked at me befuddled and was like, it's all oral. I just speak from the heart. I have notes and stuff. It's not like I send you these transcripts of ways in which I'm using scripture. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that Casey told me was like, this project is not going to be a two year, three year project. It's going to be a lifelong project of constantly gathering stories and traditions from elders and leaders. And then that's actually what our funding is for. And so in the coming weeks, uh, now the summer has hit and I keep wanting to say we're beyond the virus, but largely our, our, we haven't been able to visit with people because indigenous people are largely vulnerable to COVID. And so, uh, but now as there's vaccinations and people are feeling more confident, um, Danny and I will be traveling more to indigenous communities to talk to elders and leaders uh, to just gather and get these stories to kind of marinate in them before Danny and I begin doing our own constructive writing. Uh, so this is not just one project uh, as a lifetime kind of vocation to, to this, this larger vision. Um, Danny and I are thinking of, you know, one, we want to create a work that is accessible to college students. I think that's maybe one of our demographics and also uh, accessible to lay ministers who have no theological education, but are doing largely a lot of the work in rural uh, indigenous communities. Um, uh, but there's also a way in which this is that we, there's an ethnographic project underneath this too, of just collecting stories and being able to share those stories of our elders um, to the next generation of, of, of people coming up. Uh, Casey's story of many stories, right? It's important that doesn't it doesn't get forgotten in our annals of history here. So, um, uh, and, and there's more we could, if we spend enough time, Danny and I have like five other books out of this thing, but this is just beginning of a, uh, a lifelong journey for Danny and I, I think. 
Yeah. I would say too, like for, for me, I, I, I'm a lot more biblical study centric. I mean, that's both my studies as well as what I teach. And so, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of constantly going back to that. And so that's why I said, you know, the ethnographic components, I'm, I really feel out of my depth in some ways, but it's been great. Um, so, so I, I definitely envision that project of saying, you know, there's, there's, there's things here from the way people read as indigenous people, where they're themselves reading through, you know, their indigenous eyes, the eyes God created for them, that they see things within the text that maybe you don't see because of your own culture. And uh, that will illuminate uh, what the, what the text means. And sometimes, uh, well, not sometimes, I think it is a, a better reading of the text than, uh, what we have. And so, you know, hopefully that's, uh, hopefully it means that it's something that enters into the, you know, the academic stream of things, uh, as we read the text so that it's another, uh, voice that contributes to the interpretive method. And, um, and, and, uh, like Chris said, it's a bit of a lifelong formation, uh, for us, you know, so, uh, I didn't mention before, but you know, I'm working on a, a shorter commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, and it's intentionally from an indigenous perspective. And um, at first, I was afraid I wasn't going to hit the word count, which really wasn't that high to begin with. And now I find that I'm having to cut out a lot of things because as I've sought to like really sink into my cultural heritage and learning from indigenous elders, I find I have a lot to say. Uh, about the Jesus story in the Gospel of Matthew, um, so there's there's a lot there. Um, whereas I think there's a lot of commentaries being written by the typical, usually European white male scholar uh, that tends to say the same thing for the most part. Um, I think there'll be an increase in these different perspectives where they say I'm okay with the social location I sit in. Um, and I think actually this will offer us some uh, good good meat as we enter into the text and see new things. Well, I think we've actually run out of time, but thank you so much, both of you. It's been a wonderful presentation and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Sorry for the questions that we didn't get to, um, but I'm happy to answer by email and Chris's too. Um, yeah, Mona, I just wrote to you. I'm happy to talk to you over email. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Really appreciate y'all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.